Can we just stay in this moment of surrender? I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bit. I held everything together and watched it shatter. I stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled for surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Wonder blessings till I've been desperate to find redemption. Every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there.
Well, we put on our sexy bats, but there's a part of you that feels like you don't have it. There's a part of you, men, that sometimes we feel like a little boy playing the man role. But we kind of don't really know what we're doing sometimes. We feel scared. Ladies, your mom will get mommy guilt. Your grandma will get grandma guilt. I mean, what's so amazing about the story of Jesus is, is not that we are perfect. And not that because we come to church, we're holy. We're a mess, y'all. Come on. And I'm going to assume that we're honest about that. And if you came this morning, it's your first time here, and you feel kind of weird about coming into church, maybe you said something like, if I walk in, the walls are going to cave in. Come on, somebody. Be honest. Okay, so now you're going to send it up. Based on that reaction. Listen to me. Welcome to the club. If they don't fall in, they don't fall in the house. We don't have to show up. That's what's so amazing about Jesus. Is it that you have to... How about this? You, you, you want to get an accounting. You can't catch a fish. You can catch a fish before you catch it. So welcome, sinner. Welcome, brokenhearted. Welcome, doubtful. Welcome, anxious. Welcome, worried. Jesus says, hold them down. Because I love you. You know, there's nothing you did. This is nothing that's going to add up to anything other than my heavenly brother loves you so much. We were sitting there, and I was looking at him going, God, today, how about now? How about now? Can I go now? And finally, God sent him, and he came, and what did he do? He left perfection, and he died on the cross. He did all of your sins and all of your stuff. Yeah, last night, too. Come on. Last week, too. All that stuff. And then he said, no, I want you to do something every once in a while. We do it on the first Sunday of the night. It's called communion. Communion. To come together. Communion. In relationship. I want you to do this because it's a reminder for you. Because y'all are forgetful people. Come on, somebody. We are fickle. We are fickle. One moment we're like, hallelujah. The next minute we're in the left lane. Saying other things. Come on. And so Jesus says, every once in a while, I want you to do this, this little ceremony called communion. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a piece of bread and you're going to take some juice and some wine and somebody has to be passionate like, and we're going to use real wine. And I told him, whatever the church church turns 21, we'll use real wine. Right? We're going to take this simple piece of bread as a wafer. It's a simple thing that we use. And yes, that's not important. It's symbolic. It's symbolic when you get that bread, it's a reminder of his body that was broken for you. All that stuff, all that anxiety, all that lack of adding up that we just sang about, was, was taken care of because he hung on a cross. And he said these amazing words. He was finished. It's all taken care of. I got you. And then we take the cup, and the cup is symbolic of a new covenant. There was an old covenant, crazy stuff. Anybody grateful we're not Old Testament, Old Covenant? You know, you'd have brought your cup this morning for me to sweat and smell and sacrifice. Come on, that's the Old Testament. Thank God we ain't doing cups this morning. But instead, we drink this little cup of juice. And, and, and it's a reminder of his, of his blood, and that sounds for some people like, welcome to the vampire club, that's how good it is. It's, 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 it's symbolic of his blood because his blood represents a new covenant, a new agreement with God. And he says, not only do I forgive you and I love you, I want you to have life. Come on, somebody. And life to the full, John 10, 10 says. And so as we receive communion this morning, would you take a moment and just realize, wherever you are, can I say something to you that you really need to hear this morning? God loves you. Because of this, because of the cross, and when we take the bread and the blood, because of this, here's the visual I'm going to give you this morning. He's got your teeth on his refrigerator. No, he's not it's up there rehearsing all your faults. Come on. It's not the God holding the lightning bolt. Go ahead. One more time. Do it again. It's all this picture. He says, I love you. And I said, my son's are for you. Now do this simple ceremony to remind yourself of my great passion and love for you and my sacrifice for you. Can we do that this morning? Keep that in your mind. Spend a little time asking God to help you 
hear him, see him, in this, understand what he's trying to communicate to you through this simple ceremony. So everybody's going to go out this way into the aisle, come up to the tables, grab your cup. You're welcome to hang out for a second. Go sit there and listen to me. We're not doing it all together. Do it on your own. Go ahead and receive. We're going to receive the cup, right? I just feel comfortable. If you want to sit down, you want to pray for a moment, you want to stand here at the altar, you want to kneel at the altar. There's no formal, right, wrong way to do this. This is just about you acknowledging your God and His great compassion and love for you. Amen? Father, thank you. We take this moment. We ask Holy Spirit that you would be present with us as we celebrate and remember Jesus just like you told us to. So we remember your amazing, amazing grace through the cross and through you shedding your blood and dying for us and rising again that we might have life. Church, would you receive communion this morning as we defend the As soon as the road from the other so you can follow them out and go back around the other side. Jesus, this morning we are so grateful. So grateful for your sacrifice that you would leave perfection to come to this crazy place. Take our punishment. So we eat this bread and remember your body that was broken. 
And we remember that as the ending. As on the third day you rose again. And a new covenant was formed. And that gives us the opportunity to live life and life to the full. So thank you for these simple moments of reminder. And the fact that now we have direct access to the Father because of your sacrifice. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You see what we're saying. And I think it's perfect that we talk about now that through Jesus we have direct access to the Father. To stand as we sing, run to the Father this morning. Let's sing to him. Thank you. 
So Father God, in this moment, God, we run to an everlasting God. We run to a God that knows our mistakes, knows we're going to make a mistake, and still accept us for who we are. So Father God, in this moment, you hear the cries of your sons and daughters that cry out to you in spirit and in truth. Hey God, God, we cry out from a place of acceptance, of love, of joy, of peace. So God, begin to do a work in hearts that may be still a little hard. But God, if they will come to know you in spirit and in truth. So God, we as your little legs, we run to you. We seek you. So God, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. So we're so excited that you're here. We're about to go into a time of meet and greet. Some people may have walked in with red bands. Let's be cautious when you go in to say hey to them. It's, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All three envelopes are in there. 
Some people, when they come for the first time, they go, hey, you didn't pass any hot buckets, or you didn't. We don't do it that way. We give it all kinds of different interesting ways. You can text him. You can all kinds of, it's on the guide there. But in the back of the auditorium are boxes. Some our people put their ties and offerings in the boxes. I just want you to know that. It's your first time here. Please don't feel compelled to get just communicating that with you. And then always tell guests, the bathrooms are right here in the auditorium. So ladies, bathrooms are right around the corner right here, male on this side. So, man, we're so glad to hear. I want to invite Ethan and uh, Miss Jen to come up real quick. We started doing something last week um, that we do at every one of our staff meetings. And every one of our elder meetings, our dreams, and elder meetings, any kind of meeting that we have, I like to do these things called vision wins. Um, cause, cause I'll just be honest, it's selfish. Like, Mike needs to be encouraged every once in a while. Do y'all need to be encouraged every once in a while? You know what I mean? It, it's hard to read your stories, right? And every once in a while, an elder meeting, I'll forget to start with that, and Donald will be like, time out. Come on, give us some vision wins, right? Come on, Doc. Right? And, and so, uh, a couple vision wins, these ladies will tell you a couple stories. You can tell us a, tell us a vision win. All right, good morning. So, um, sorry I have to see my face again today. Um, so, we, uh, last week we loved all of the baptisms. And my, one of my daughters, which she just actually got to do her first communion. Hey, God, that was awesome. Um, so, last week we had talked multiple times, about three weeks ago. She came up to me and said, hey, I want to ask Jesus to be the boss of my life. It was super awesome. We're not going to cry. It was super awesome. Um, so we, we talked, and I had asked her, I said, so what's, what's the next step? She's like, well, I need to get baptized. I said it all like that, but I need to get baptized. And I said, okay, well, do you want to do it? You don't have to do it right now. You can take your time. But she was scared to have all of you people staring at her. Um, so last week, when uh, Coach Greg and Coach Karen from the martial arts program got baptized, she got so excited because she's, she's been doing martial arts, and so seeing them, we thought it would be more seeing some of the kids get baptized that would get her excited. But when she saw Coach Greg and Coach Karen getting baptized, she said, okay, Mom, I'm ready. They can do it. I can do it. And it's, it's awesome that she wants to get baptized. But the more I thought about it, if it weren't for my martial arts program, that wouldn't have been a thing for her because that was somebody that she looks up to her sex. She would have no idea who they were if not for that. So I was like, okay, God, thank you for the martial arts program, if for nothing else, because my baby girl wants to be baptized. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm here to tell you about a win, but, but we had a big win this past weekend. Can I tell them about that? Hey, yeah. Where my ladies at? Okay, we had the ladies retreat. Friday night and Saturday night at the plantation in Crystal River. And all of us ladies, we sang, we danced, we hula, we painted a canvas. We worked, uh, um, talked about grace, we learned about forgiveness and purpose. We had so much fun. We roomed together, we stayed up late, we ate chocolate and cookies and a chop, 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 chop. Uh, it was so fun. Um, and I could go on and on, but I'm going to get fired if I do. So there's just one really big win that I just loved seeing on the weekend is we had time for a small group table discussion. And then my prime timers, uh, just two that come to mind, there were more than these two prime timers there. But my prime timers, Miss Marty Meyer and Miss Jenny Frazier, they were amazing because I was milling about, you know, just being nosy, listening in to what people are saying. And then there was a single mom having a hard time uh, crying. We did a lot of crying, too. That's what we do. Uh, and Miss Marty just put her hand on her shoulder and said, yes, but what's the best way to deal with this? I just, her heart was like, how can I help this young woman in, in the faith handle you know, what the drama she's going through. Miss, Miss Marty, my prime timer, bring in the peace of God, the hope that is all of our birthright. We sometimes forget. So we need the older ladies in the church to teach us, to remind us, to keep us focused. Oh, that was awesome. I just walked by like, yeah, Miss Marty. Yeah. And Miss Jenny Fraser, I don't know if you all know Miss Jenny. She's got a walker. You know how hard it is to stay overnight for one night? you got to pack everything and stay one night. Right? Multiple nights, right? Multiple nights, right? like this guy. And girls got a walker. She's got a walker. 
And this place is so old, didn't it look, it's so old, it's called the plantation, people. But that's how old this place is. It was nice. It was nice. We didn't even have elevators. So Miss Jenny and her walker going all over campus, ministering to younger ladies of the faith, and they're worshiping Jesus. And you know how these young people worship. We have people around, we have tattoos, piercings, praising their God, singing to their Savior in their way. Okay? I know Miss Jenny's probably not used to tattoo clad worship leaders, but you know what? She was there and just smiling and loving on these younger ladies and letting these ladies worship their God and their Savior with joy in her heart. And oh, I had a young lady say to me, I'm going to be just like Miss Jenny when I grow up. Mm. Mm. I'm serious. I mean, I come in here for that one song, and Mr. Marcus is like, I'm going to run to him again and again and again. And I want you to know, be cute. I'm going to be just like Miss Jenny with my walker. I'm going to be coming to my Savior again and again and again. May it be so. Sorry. Okay, so my little seven year old, we're setting up that next children's ministry. Seven year old kid comes up to me and goes, Miss Jenny, I made a really important decision this weekend. You know, kids, they say the craziest things. You're like, oh, yeah, really cool. What would you do? He said, I'll make Jesus boss of my life. I'm like, yeah, right, whatever. Y'all are like, yeah, I did it. Okay, I do children's ministry. You can't convince a kid of anything. You know what I'm saying? He just said he made Jesus boss of his life. I'm like, yeah? Tell me more. He goes, well, I did something wrong, and I knew I needed to confess my sin. So I told my grandma, well, my mom was doing another lap because she had to close her ring. Y'all know what I'm talking about? She had to close her ring. So I told my grandma, I need to confess my sin. And I, I really need to make that decision to make Jesus boss of my life. Because I know he's the son of God, and I know he died on the cross. And I know he was dead for three days in the tomb. And after three days, he came out of the tomb, and he appeared to a lot of other people. He's the son of God. And I asked him to be boss of my life forever. And my jaw hit the ground. I don't know what to and then I got all excited. I'm like, okay, you know what we got to do next. And in my head, I'm thinking, we got to tell your small group leader how she's going to be so proud of you. I'm, I'm a theologian genius. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm thinking. And he says to me, yeah, I got to get baptized. I'm like, I drop this right now, but I get in trouble. But I'd be like, thumbs up. Well, bam. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, next week we need God. Pastor Mike will be in children's ministry. Jim will be taking over the stage. <laughs> that is one amazing life. She was absolutely awesome. But, hey, uh, we're so glad you're here this morning because we're starting a brand new series. A uh, brand new series that we're starting this morning. I'm very excited about this. And, again, um, it's, it's um, we're going to step on our toes a little bit. Can I just warn you now? Can, can I say that just a little bit? Like we're going to dive in a little bit. Every, every once in a while, people will, 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 ch- will challenge us to kind of being a, 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 a light church, a fun church, because we laugh so much and this kind of stuff. And they go, like, but, you know, I want it deep. Well, okay, you ready? Because we're going to have deep, okay? We're, we're going to push in a little bit and deal with something called the me monster. The me monster. The word that the Bible deals with is, is selfishness. Now, because this is going to be so heavy to start, I thought I would introduce you to someone maybe you already know, but one of my favorite comedians is a dude by the name of Brian Reed. And dude is hilarious and clean, and the whole inspiration comes from this little skit. Let me show you a little piece of it. I'm actually kind of quiet off stage. A lot of people don't realize that. I was at a dinner party recently. A bunch of people that I don't know. One guy talking plenty for everybody. And then me, myself, right? And then I, and then myself, right? Me, me. I couldn't tell this one about I because I was talking about myself, and then me, 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 me. Beware the me monster. 
So I tried to jump in with a little story. I don't want to just sit there the whole night. Right when I'm done with my story, this guy goes, that ain't nothing. <laughs> oh, well, didn't mean to waste everybody's time. <laughs> Telling my nothing story. Here, let Marco Polo speak. He's back with tales of adventure. My story ain't nothing. Maybe it wasn't, because I made the mistake of trying to tell a story about having only two wisdom teeth pulled, and I learned a lesson. Don't ever try to tell a two wisdom tooth story, because you ain't going nowhere. The four wisdom teeth people are going to parachute in and cut you off at the pass. Halt! Halt with your two wisdom tooth tail! You will never complete one, trust me. I'm trying to tell my story. You know, I had some wisdom teeth pulled. I had, um... I had two, but I had four pulled. Oh, okay. No, five, no, nine. I had nine wisdom teeth pulled. All of mine were impacted. They were all coming upside down. The roots were wrapped around my tongue, coming out my nose. They were tusks. I was a warthog. No anesthesia. They pulled them out with pliers. I was eating corn in the cob that afternoon. Pin the blue ribbon upon his chest. That knocks the socks off of my wisdom tooth tail. Why do people need to top other people? I've never understood it, and I see it all the time. Obviously, people get something out of it. At best, people wait for your lips to stop. Yeah, as soon as... Okay, yeah, you, me! You, me! You see the difference? You see, you see that? Now I do. What is it about the human condition? People get something out of that. That's why I have a social fantasy. I wish I was one of the 12 astronauts who have been on our moon. They must love knowing they can beat anybody's story whenever they want. They can sit back quietly at a dinner party while some other person, some me monster, is doing his thing and let him go. Let him run with the line while you be quiet. Oh, really? <laughs> let him have his moment. Yeah, I'm a big traveler. I have my business all. I got my own global enterprise. I got to check on. You know, I'm driving in the Autobahn because I keep a fleet of sports cars over in Zurich. You know, I got a Swiss account that I don't want to check it. Mount Kilimanjaro expedition. Might have to cancel that. You know, the runways in Aspen are a lot shorter the first time you go in there. You know, the you know, you know, Pacific Rim Company is going to try to take that over. And I don't know. No, no, global enterprise. I don't know. I don't know. I walked on the moon. <laughs> well, you have the floor, moonwalker. <laughs> you know, you mentioned driving on the Autobahn. That reminded me. Once I was driving in the Sea of Tranquility. <laughs> in my lunar rover. And I, too, was worried about our speed till I remembered, wait, we're the only ones on the moon. That's awesome stuff right there. That's awesome. The Mee Monster. So we're going to talk a little bit about Mee Monster. You know, we live in a culture that has become extremely self-absorbed. If you're really honest. And I'm going to step on some toes. Forgive me, but it, 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 does anyone ever... Think about or grasp the concept of a selfie. Because now the research is showing the more selfies that people do and post and all that kind of stuff, the more potential they have for actually mental health struggles and issues. Because as a culture, we've become so self absorbed And so we're going to tackle this topic for the next few weeks. And every one of us is dealing with this in one form or fashion. The mean monster is the thing inside of us that always wants a little bit more that wants to focus on the attention or, or wants our thoughts and ideas to be expressed because there's a part of us that thinks we have more sense than other people. Come on. I want a little more out of life. I want a little more money for my job. I want a little more out of this relationship. What about me? Often, if we're really honest, we're consistently asking the question like this. What's in it for me? 
What's in this relationship for me? What's in this job for me? What's in this church for me? What's in this message today for me? What's in this friendship for me, this small group? Now, it's a tension. Because if we're honest, most of us find ourselves at this wrestle. And here's the tension. The tension is, I've been to church enough times, or I've heard enough people give me the ethic, and it's not a biblical standard, it's an ethic of some sort, that you shouldn't be too much about you, that you shouldn't be selfish. So most of us understand that concept. But then there's the tension on the other side of this. But but, but who's going to protect me? If I don't take care of me, who's going to take care of me? If I don't protect me, who's going to protect me? So come on, you've been in a situation at work, school, neighborhood, wherever, and you felt this tension. Maybe you didn't consciously recognize it the way we're talking about it now. But the tension of... I'm feeling kind of like someone's screwing me over here. But am, am, I, am I being selfish? Or, or do I protect myself? Come on, is anybody else or is this just me? Right? There's, there's this wrestle and this, and this, and, and, and this thing, this, this mini monster. If the truth is told of all of us, some of us talk about our, our family, some of us talk about how bad life is. Prayer requests are consist- consistently about us, what we need or what we lack. Victim mentality is a version of this, of the me monster. Me and my sadness, me and my illness, me and my fill in the blank. It can show up in many different ways. So I want to begin to tackle this subject, as we're going to do over the next four weeks. I'm telling you what I think is some of the worst advice that is ever given, but is the most prevalent advice usually given within our culture. Worst advice ever, here it is. You need to find yourself. You need to find yourself. So we do things like we leave high school and backpack Europe for a year. Right? Or we go on these trips or, 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 or we do these things. Some of us have been on that journey and, and, and you know, some of us have, have tried multiple relationships. And I guess this new relationship has failed to have it found ourselves. So, you know, we dump them, you know, whatever. It starts when we move out of the house for many of us. All of a sudden, the security that I didn't realize that my home provided is not there. Who am I? Where am I going? Pressure to figure it out. No longer am I 20 somethings here, right? This pressure, this struggle, the assumption in our culture says this to us. Listen, more of me equals better. More of me equals better. I can prove it to you. Go to a bookstore. One of the largest sections in our bookstores. Or self-help book, self-help aisles, right? If you just make yourself better, if you just learn a little bit more, if you just do the knowledge thing, if you increase your intelligence, if you increase your abilities, if you do more, more of me is better. Then if I just focus on myself and figure out what I want and what I like, the more self-focused I am, the more I pay attention to me, the better off I'm going to and so then counselors will say something like this to someone. Well, you just need to leave him because you deserve to be happy. You hear that? John 3 and 30, listen to this. He, this is talking about Jesus. He must become greater. I must become less. Radically different from the message of our current culture is the message of the Bible, and it says this, less of you means more. Less of you means more. When I look at what Jesus says, less of me means more. If you want the secret to fulfillment in your life, listen to this. If you can't take, a, if you can't take the spotlight off of you and how great your life is or how sad your life is, come on, we do the same thing on both ends, or how you feel the less of you means more. More of you never leads to, to where you think it will. More of you never leads to where you think it will. Every time I've tried to put more of me in my job, come on, somebody, more of my rights into relationships, more of me into my friendships, they all got worse. Every time. Every time. And every time I take a step back and focus less on myself, 
I'm less obsessed with me and what I want and what I need and things getting better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the better the relationships get. Mark 8, 34, let me say it to you this way. Then he called a crowd to him along with his disciples. This is Jesus. And he says these words. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up your cross means die. Die to yourself. Not more of me, less of me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Jesus taught this over and over. But I want to look at one story that Jesus told today. This story shows what happens when you go and try to find yourself. When you say, enough with you, I'm going to go and do my own thing. I'm going to go find myself. So this is a parable. This is not a historical. When Jesus says there was a man and two sons, this is not a historical event. This is a story he made up. Why? Because Jesus would constantly tell stories to help us understand who God is in our relationship to him. So he gives this parable. Now the interesting thing is, this is probably the most well-known parable in the entire Bible. Most of you have heard this story. Most of us have had any reaction to church and heard this story. So I'm going to ask you to do this. When I start to read it, don't do what we typically do in church. Oh yeah, no, that's right. You follow me? I'm shut down. I'm going to ask you to push in a little bit, ask the Holy Spirit to give you fresh eyes, to consider a couple of things that I'd like to point out to you today. But before I read the story, let me say how the story is set up by Jesus. Because he tells two other parables before he tells this parable. He tells the parable of the lost coin, right? That there's a woman that she loses her coin. Now, we put it in today's language. She lost her welfare check. You know, it's all she has. It's everything she has. She loses the coin and eventually she finds the coin. He tells this, the story of the lost sheep. And there's the one sheep and you leave the 99 to go up to the one and we find the sheep and we bring the sheep back. But he wants us to understand something. This is not about sheep and this is not about things. What he's actually trying to talk about is that people get lost. And so he says these words in Luke 15, 11, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. And so what he wants us to hear is this is about people, right? This is, this is about people getting lost. And I would dare say with a crowd this size, there's somebody here today who feels lost. You came in and you got a smile on your face, and we do the church thing. Right? And we, and we do the mask thing. We're really good at putting on masks and pretending like everything's hunky dory with us. And, and we put up our social media and we brand ourselves so that it looks just right. Who the body? Right? When everybody else knows that Christmas card you sent out, you were whipping that kid right before he smiled in that picture. Come on. And we, and we put, put masks on to pretend. And so he, he wants to point something out to us. So let's look at this story. He said, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want your share of the estate now before you die. Now I want you to imagine right now, your 19-year-old coming to you and saying, hey, am I in the will? Like my first reaction would be like, shut up, go away. Like right there, right? You know, kind of thing, but you can change it. Like, am I in the will? Yeah, you're in the will. Of course you're in the will. He's like, okay, I want it now. Okay, rude. What do you mean you want it now? Let me ask you a question. Does the father have any kind of idea of what might happen if he gives it to him now? Right? Like many of us, we got to a certain age, and you remember things. Anybody remember the age when you knew everything? I mean, you've forgotten it now. But you did know everything at one point. Right? And that's our, that's our kid here in the story. Do you think that the father knew what would happen if he gave it to him? Of course he did. So read the next verse. So his father agreed. What? That's lousy parenting. That's my first reaction. Come on, Dad, this is the perfect moment for you to get a little teaching in here and say, look, boy, you're not ready, and your brain doesn't develop to your 25, science shows, blah, 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 bl
like us dads do. But he doesn't. The father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons, and I, and at first, on face value, you go, what the heck? But what we've got to understand, what Jesus is telling, remember, this is a parable. And he's trying to get us to understand something. So what he wants you and I to understand is this is the way God the Father has dealt with us. See, we've already gotten our life and all the things that you have and your personality and spiritual gifts. All the things that he has allowed you to have right now, he has given to you by his grace. And you can do whatever you want with this life. You can do whatever you want with it. See, we are the prodigal son who has already been given this life to do whatever we want with it. It says, it goes on, a few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And he says, I'm out, right? I'm going to do my thing, right? Many of us have ran from what we thought was a stifling situation in our home. Come on, somebody. Be real. My parents don't understand. There's stifling around here. There's no more freedom. Many of us ran. Many of us, that is our relationship, catch this, still with authority. Because our parents said A and we said B. And God says to do this and we say, ah, that looks a lot better. So what happened? Did the young man take it and invest it in a dividend producing portfolio? Maybe he give it to charity and build an orphanage. Name it after his father. No, he did exactly what we think he would do. Party on, right? And there he wasted all his money in wild living. And we won't get the point of this story until later, and we're not going to read this part, but I just want to tell you the older brother at one point tells us the details. Hunters, booze, drugs, come on. All of it. He just blew it, partying. Do you think, let me ask the question again, do you think the father did not know what was going to happen? Do you think your heavenly father did not know when he gave you the freedom to choose what you choose in this life that you might wild out a little bit? That you might lose your mind? That you might get outside of what he had designed for you? And some of you might say, yeah, that's kind of what I've done with my life up until this point. Let's keep reading the story. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. The land was a recession and gas was like, Five dollars got what's going on now. Come on, somebody. Right? Can you imagine like blowing it right now, going broke right now? Try to live in our current economy. That's kind of this situation here. And it says here he persuaded a local farmer to hire him because he's broke. How many of you know you got lots of friends when you show them out the cash? Come on. When I try it out, everybody's like ghosting you, blocked you on social media. Come on. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And he goes, okay, what's the big deal about that? No, 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 you got to catch this. Go to a big city, go to a Jewish uh, delicatessen, and, and ask for a bagel with bacon on it. I dare you. See if you don't get your butt kicked out. Why? Because good Jewish boys don't do pigs, y'all. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They don't do pigs. So this symbolizes something. He goes to the fields to feed the pigs. Hear this. Trying to find yourself will lead to the worst possible situations. It will lead to the worst possible situation. The young man became so hungry that even the pods, there was even the pigs who could get him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally, and this is one of my favorite parts of this whole story, when he finally hears the words, came to his senses. When you look up some of the original text, you can translate that. When he finally came to the end of himself. Anybody else been there? I've been there. Somebody came to the end of himself, right? Where I had messed up all my relationships and made a mess out of my life and I had no money and everything else. And I had to humbly, and I did exactly this. I humbly called my mother and said, Can I please come home? And my mother said to me, yeah, you can come home, but you have one rule. I said, okay. And then we went back to my mind. I'm like, I'm 24 years old. What, what 
room. She said, you have 11 o'clock curfew. And I said, what? <laughs> she said, I'm not waiting up all night while you're crazy, but I'm doing whatever. God knows why that I'm worried about. It. So I can humble myself and home. Right? Some of you are there. Some of you have been there. Some of you, listen to me, please hear me. You're headed there. You don't catch this idea of more of you is not going to lead to better. Right? When he finally came to the end of himself, right? he's pursued himself in every direction and there's nothing left. And he comes to the place where he says, I am so sick and tired of doing this. So he says to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. My father treats his hired servants better than, catch this, the world treats me. Your heavenly father will always treat you better than this world will treat you. Every time. It's not the way you like it, when you want it, and in your timing. But it's always perfect. Always. He says, I'll go home to the Father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me as your hired servant. That right there is called shame. Anybody ever get there? A shame. Many of us maybe are still in that place. I ruined that marriage. I burned through those relationships. I wasted that job opportunity. I burned through that money. I'm too ashamed to talk to anyone about what is really going on with me. There is no way that God would welcome me back. Next verse says, so he returned home to the Father. Look, what was going through his head the whole way back? Can you picture the anxiety? Can you picture him practicing? Okay, Dad, um, I know I really kind of blew it. That was, no, that's too much. Um, can, can you hear any rehearsing? What do you like say? Can you hear any like, going through the scenarios? If I walk up, is Dad just going to, like, slap me across the face? If I walk up, he's not going to say anything. He's just going to walk in the house and slam the door in my head. What kind of, there's this anxiety. But on the other end of the spectrum, what's the father thinking? What's going through the father's head? I said something to you earlier that I'm going to pull back now. Because the Father, our Heavenly Father, remember that's what this represents in this story, is not in the habit of rehearsing your failures. That's not who He is. Let me show you. Next verse. We're continuing that verse. And while He was still a long way off, His Father saw Him coming. Question. How do you see someone far off? Answer. You have to be looking. The innuendo here is that our Heavenly Father, what Jesus is trying to say to each and every one of us, is that your Heavenly Father looks for you every day. Every day. And in the story, we don't know. Has it been 100 days, 200 days, 1,000 days? We don't know. It doesn't matter. The innuendo is every day the Father goes out into the fields and looks down the road and thinks today could be the day. He's not in the habit of rehearsing everything the son did wrong. He's looking and going, today could be, is he down there? No. Okay, not today. Maybe tomorrow. And he comes back day after day after day, and your heavenly father listens to me. Every day comes out to the field, looks down the road, and looks for you. And says, no matter what, I'm not in the habit of rehearsing your failures. I'm here to celebrate your return. That's what he says about you. Can we prove it? Next part of the story. Filled with love and compassion. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son when he saw him. He embraced him and kissed him. That is what God, our Heavenly Father, thinks about you. I think that's tough for some of us to grab. Because we've bought a concept that we are so far gone, we are so far messed up, no one could ever love us. There's no way that God could take me back. And I need you to hear something this morning. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is nothing that you can do to make your Heavenly Father love you anymore. Nothing that you can do to make your Heavenly Father love you any less. 
He is in the field every day looking down the road saying maybe today is the day that they'll come back and get to the end of themselves and the struggle of this world and come back and do life the way I intended them to do life. He said, starts in, here it goes. He says to him, Father, I'm sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I love this moment because it's almost like the father is not even kind of paying attention. Because he's going to, and, and, and I, I can almost see the sound like, hello, well, father, um, I am no longer, you know, like the nerves and all this. But check the next verse out. When his father says to the servants, he didn't even listen to the servants, he didn't even Says to the servants, quick, bring the finest robes in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf. We have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Let me say this to you again. Our God is not in the habit of rehearsing your failures. He is in the habit of celebrating your return and looking for your return every single day. Verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Look at those words. So let the party begin. Come on, somebody. Verse 15, come join me as we get close to closing up the stage. You guys over here, come, come on up and join me as, as we get ready to close. Let me ask you a question as the worship teams get set when you're ready to close the service. Let me ask you. Where? Where does that leave you? Where does that leave us? In your attempt to find yourself, did you lose yourself? The more you focus on yourself, the more miserable you become. The more in a relationship that you focus on your rights in that relationship, and then it goes wrong, and then you dump that person, and you go to somebody else because, well, you know, we haven't figured out, we haven't found ourselves yet. Come on. The more you do this, the more you lose yourself. What can I get from my job? What can I get here? What can I get? What can I get? Me, 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 me. And you lose yourself. You lose who you were created to be. Here's the irony of life and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus. And it's this. What you thought would bring you freedom brings chains. What you thought would bring success Brings failure. What you thought would be life and fun and joy and all, well, you hadn't died, but it feels like death. Why is my heart so numb? Why is there so little joy? Why is this job so unfulfilling? Why is this relationship not working out? And there's a solution. It's actually two solutions. The solution this world has for us, and this is the solution of our culture, more of you. More of you. Go read tough help books. Go back to school, get another degree. Go, go, go to the tech school and get this new program under your belt. Do you know the most commonly used words in advertising today? in our culture, you deserve it. Come on, that's the world's response to this emptiness that we feel sometimes, this, this lack that is, is inside of our soul. But there's a different response that the Bible has for us, that God has for us, and it's this. Less of you, the more of Jesus. Less of me, the more of Jesus. Less of self-absorption. Less me and my pain. Me and my problems. Me and my success. Me and my brilliance. Me and my greatness. Me and my trophies. It's not more of me. Church, it's, it's less of me. See, the paradox is that the son becomes more of who he wanted to be the moment he realized that less of him meant more. Less of doing life his way and more of doing life the Father's way. He found true life. Now, you can try to do it without God. But let me say it to you this way. Less of you without God leads to self-pity and despair. Right? It's something called false humility. 
Humility is not thinking. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's a false humility. But less of you with God leads to more. Why? Because he's the creator. He created you with a certain design and a certain purpose. And so what we look at as crazy, I'm supposed to surrender my life to God, I'm supposed to give everything to him and, and like do what he says in that book. It just kind of feels like a bunch of do's and don'ts and that just doesn't sound fun. And what do I have to do? Like walk around with an iron outfit all the time. And when we create these crazy things inside of our own, instead of understanding, no, 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 no. When you surrender to him and do like his way, that's where fulfillment comes. That's where you find a, a, a joy in your soul that is, is hard to even comprehend or understand until you've experienced it. So I had, I started with the worst advice, but let me give you the greatest news that anybody can give you. <laughs> God embraces me monsters. Come on. God embraces me monsters. See, there's only one way back to the Father, and that's through Jesus. More of Jesus means more of everything. Let me show it to you in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be given to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So that's what we're going to tackle for the next few weeks. I'm going to challenge you to go back. Come back, because we're going to tackle the new monster in some specific areas that I think will bring health. Next week, we're going to talk about the new monster in love. We're going to talk about dating. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about relationships. And how the new monster really affects those and creates dysfunctional, unhealthy scenarios, and then we don't find the fulfillment in relationships that God really needs for us to. The, the next week, we're going to talk about stuff or money or resources or however you want to say it. And how the me monster inside of us gets us off track as we focus on those And then finally, we're going to talk about identity. Who am I? Why am I here on this planet? So I want to challenge you to come back in the next few weeks as we tackle this thing called the me monster. But I've got to leave you with that one thought today. And I just hope these words ring in your head all week long. And it's just simply this. Listen to me. Less of me is more. Less of me is more. The less I keep chasing after my own desires, the things I want, the more misery that comes. Surrender feels scary. It's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. So let me ask you this morning. Where are you with that? Where, where are you in this story? Are you a prodigal? of some sort. Maybe you've been far away from God for a while. Maybe you've been saved for many, many years and been in church, but if you're honest, you're feeling lost. The relationship is not there. You pray and you feel like you're going to heaven one day, but the relationship is distant or strained or something. You find yourself more engulfed into your own struggles and issues and your prayer requests look like, for me, for me, for me. Here's what God would say to you today. Would you come today? Would you, would you today go, okay, I heard, I heard it through the worship. I heard it through the prayers. I mean, everything we've done today has been surrendered. is around this concept of surrender. And I just want to challenge you with that. I just want to challenge you. Would today be the day that you would go, okay? I've come to the end of myself. I've come to my senses. I want to give it. I try to God and surrender my heart to Him today fully, whether for the first time or in great commitment today. So you close your eyes and let me pray for you this morning. Father, and we all come to you from different places today, different struggles, different hurts. Some are here today and have never really had a relationship with you, maybe know a little bit about you or heard a little about you, maybe been to church a little bit, but today, we're talking about your heart a little bit. That's you today. I just want to encourage you that God loves you right where you are. 
he wants to take you just like you are. And I'm going to leave you there. And he'll take you just like you are because he loves you that much. And if that's you today, you can surrender your heart to Jesus by praying a simple prayer like this. Nothing special about my words. What's important is the sincerity of your heart. And it would go something like this, Jesus. Today I surrender my life to you. I don't understand it all. And if I'm honest, I'm probably a little nervous about praying this prayer. But I hear today that you love me. And you've got a design for my life. And today I've come to the end of me. So I surrender me to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Help me now to live the way you have designed me to live. Maybe you already prayed that prayer, but today you will pray something like this, Father. Today, I just recommit because I have gotten lost. I've gotten distracted by the monster and chasing things that I thought were important or that I thought were, were what I should do. So today, I recommit my heart and my life. I surrender once again to you. Holy Spirit, bring me back on track to be who you've called me to be. I pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, listen, we're going to close in just a second. What we normally do for those of you who are new, um, our team is going to sing another worship song. And when they start to sing, you are dismissed and you can go. But oftentimes people will stay in worship for a few minutes and just ponder what God has said. And so let me suggest that before you just run out the door. You might want to wait just for a minute, say a little bit. And uh, think about what it is that God has said to you today. Because listen to me, don't waste the last hour and a half of your life just in having it be a moment, right? It comes and goes. But God, God is, is talking to you and wanting to you to respond. What does it look like for you to respond? For those of you who haven't been to Life Steps, we're starting Life Step 1 today. I'll meet you in the rock out the door, down to the left, down the hallway. I'll meet you there. Four weeks that we take for you to understand more about the church. So if you'd like to join us, we love to have you here. Church, two things I'm going to finish with, right? Two things I'm going to finish with. And that is, less of me is more. Yes? And every day he's looking for you because he loves you in that way. Yes? Less of me is more. Every day he's looking at you. All of our small groups are starting with a new book. Better uh, this decision for your regrets. We finally got them in. They're out there for sale if you want to grab out of the lobby. But if you want, stand your feet. Let's worship God as we close out service today. Love you guys. Thank you.